The nail she drove into our oldest tree, was the final nail to her coffin. If you like true revenge stories, you found the best place for your vengeful needs. In this episode, it seems that you might want to keep your enemies closer, ideally as your neighbors. We start off with a neighbor douche that damages the car of a decorated war hero, a peach-loving neighborhood disrupted by a Karen. Followed by a psycho neighbor resorting to violence. Lastly, two bad roommates versus one vengeful spirit. Let's dive in. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts might be disturbing to snowflakes. Back in 1991, my dad bought my mom a brand new Chevy Caprice. You know, the big ugly fat cop car. It was white, with fake mesh wheels and white wall tires. My mother loved it. She had it two weeks and kept it parked in front of our house in Southern California. The guy across the street was a contractor. Back in 1991, that basically meant shady douchebag that hired illegals that stood outside Home Depot. Shady douche started remodeling a house up the street from us on our side of the road. They were doing some stucco work. At the end of the day, his workers decided to just dump the leftover stucco in the gutter and try to hose it down the street. It got all over my mom's tires. She didn't notice, drove off and it went all over the passenger side of her car. My dad wasn't happy. Not one bit. He went across the street to talk to the contractor neighbor. My dad is a 6 feet 3 inches Air Force Vietnam Purple Heart recipient. He has fired a weapon in anger before. Neighbor was a 5 feet 4 inches douche with an attitude. Dad goes over and explain the situation, actually keeping his calm. He asks the guy to have the stucco removed from the car. The neighbor tells my dad to go frick himself. I'm expecting my dad at this point to go kill mode. Instead, he says, okay and walks back across the street. He has my mom's car detailed, and that's that. Seven years later. My dad and I are watching a Laker game, and it's about 10 at night and it's half time. My dad says, I will be right back. He walks out of the house, goes into the garage and gets two one-gallon buckets of paint. He walks across the street and dumps it all over the neighbor's brand new BMW convertible. The neighbor had left the top down because it was in May and the weather was nice in Southern California. So, the entire outside and inside of the BMW is now covered in paint. My dad walks back, puts the paint cans back in the garage, closes the door, and comes back to watch the rest of the game. The next morning, douche neighbor comes out and sees his car. We hear him saying out loud to his wife, I don't understand who would have done this. I don't get this at all. He had forgotten all about the stucco. My dad just waited and waited. Fast forward to now. Seven years ago, another booty hole down the road hit my dog and killed him, then drove off. I found his hubcap in the road next to my dog and confronted him. Oh I thought it was a deer. The person who hit my dog did so with his work van. I must render it inoperable so his business takes a hit. I am waiting for a really nice day. The paint is ready in my basement. Well, let's start a few years in the past. My great-grandparents planted an orchard, it is now at least 120 years old. My grandparents and my parents were really proud of the peach trees growing in it and did their best to keep them in good health and well. We always threw a big party when the peaches were ready to be harvested and invited all of our friends and neighbors to it. I loved those parties. The neighbors on the property to the south of our orchard were particularly fond of our peaches. They were a bunch of fine old people and me and the old man, named Sam, were pretty good friends. He taught me a lot about woodworking with hand tools and we had some great evenings in his workshop. We finished many a good whiskies in there together. In return he got a lot of fine peaches, marmalade, homemade peach liqueur etc. Sadly he died a good 10 years ago, cancer is crap. His wife followed soon after, many suspected it was of a broken heart. They had no kids, so all of their property was left to the state, except his tools and whiskey collection, which he had gifted me a few weeks before he died. In comes Karen. The name speaks for itself. 
haircut, attitude, skankiness. The whole deal. She bought the property of my late neighbors. We hadn't had the kind of money to buy it at that time, as we had met some dire straits the years before and all our savings were gone. The first thing she did, before she actually moved in, was to go round and making demands of the neighbors on the surrounding properties. When it was finally our turn to listen to her gibberish, she told us that we needed to remove half of the trees, as the leaves were blowing on her property. We told her in a polite way, that we won't comply to her demands as the orchard is a vital part of our family heritage, tradition, life in the neighborhood and it has been there for at least 120 years. She was pretty pissed, but did nothing for the time being. There are some things you need to know before I continue with the story. The workshop I mentioned before, was situated right at the border to our property. It was a small timber-framed building, at least 160 to 180 years old. The regulations in my state are pretty strict concerning old structures. Every structure over 100 years is protected and you need a special permission to tear it down. Failing to get this permission can lead to a hefty fine. To get the permission to build a new building, it has to be up to code and you have to ask your surrounding neighbors and if they agree, you're good to go. Except there is one specialty in my county. You have to keep a certain distance to the border of the property to allow emergency services full access to your property. If one of these requirements isn't met, the building is illegal or at least only partially legal and can actually be ordered by court to be torn down. That might come in handy later. So, back to my Karen. After our first encounter with her, she did her best to pester the whole neighborhood. She actually got the neighbor's dog put down, because he allegedly attacked her. It later turned out she faked the attack. The dog was the sweetest and most innocent dog you could imagine. A Bernese mountain dog, big but a real teddy bear. Anyways, she later got us to stop doing our annual peach parties, as she called the police every time for various reasons. Noise complaints as we had a band playing there in the afternoon, arson because we lit a fire in a designated fire pit in the middle of our property. She called the ATF on us, allegedly making moonshine, but my dad had a license to distill for our own consumption. In short, she was a real pain in the bum bum and after three years we decided it wasn't worth it to deal with various officers and law enforcement agencies every time we threw the party and we decided to quit. After she had reached this goal, she resorted to pestering us to remove the orchard. We didn't cave in and some things started to get really fishy. Somehow the tires of our trucks got slashed, eggs got thrown on our farmhouse, our cat disappeared and surfaced a few days later in pretty rough condition. It looked like somebody had tried to cut his tail off. Don't worry, he healed up completely, but we actually couldn't prove that she did all that. Then came the day she made her biggest mistake. She had a company come in, in a sort of secret operation and tear down the old woodworking workshop overnight. Two days later, they started building a big garage right where the shop was, but she missed one fine detail, which got pretty important later on. She didn't ask for our permission, nor for the neighbors. A short while after, the trees right next to her property started to get sick. The leaves turned brown in the middle of summer, and the branches started to die. We lost four trees, before we figured out the cause. Somebody had driven long copper nails into them. We had a suspicion, but we couldn't prove it. So we put up some trail cameras. Perfectly legal, as it was on our own property. We caught her red-handed. My dad confronted her, she apologized and my dad, being the way too nice guy he is, wanted to let her get off the hook. But not me. The nail she drove into our oldest tree was the final nail to her coffin. I started to investigate. I had some friends at the administration of our county and asked them to do some inquiries. Turned out she hasn't applied for permission to tear down the old shop, nor for permission to build a new building. I further did some inquiries on the borderline of our property. Turned out, the old markers vanished over time and her building was about three feet on our property. After I had gathered all this information, I presented it to my parents. At first they were reluctant as they didn't want to start a neighborhood clash. But after I recalled all the things she did to us and our neighbors, they were in. So let the games begin. 
first we called the authorities on her for tearing down a protected building and presented them with all the evidence we gathered. Then we called the building authorities on her for building a building without permission, not up to code, and not only didn't she keep the required distance to the property border, she also built on our property without our permission. Long story short, turned out the workshop hasn't only been protected because of its age, but also because it was a historical landmark, which played a vital role in a conflict back in the 1860s. She got sued for this, and had to pay a fine of an equivalent of about $150,000. She further had to demolish her newly built building, costing an additional $50,000, got fined for this too, about $83,000, and had to rebuild the workshop on her own expense which was another whopping $154,000, as it had to be period correct up to the smallest detail. Means it had to be built with the correct materials, with hand tools only and to the correct dimensions. As you can imagine, paying professionals to build quite a large timber-framed building, only by hand, gets pretty expensive pretty fast. So, all in all, it cost her an equivalent of $437,000 plus further expenses as lawyers etc. This caused her to go bankrupt, so she had to sell the property in the end, which my parents bought, by the way. Last I heard of her was that she moved back to the big city. Buckle up for this one, this is how we got our neighbors evicted. My wife and I live in a townhouse complex. For anyone outside of my country, it's like a row of houses in a gated community. Our complex has three rows with six houses and one row with five, need room for that community pool. The two evil neighbors in question lived across from us, the one right across from us was unit 10 and the one to their right was unit 11. What you need to know is the driveway separating each of the rows. It's wide enough to fit two cars just enough. If both cars traveling slowly they can pass each other with ease. When they first moved in we got along okay with them. I even played games with their kids, three each per unit when walking past to my house from the car park. I thought they were good families as when the kids did something like kick balls at our wall and not stop, I would tell the parents and the kids got punished. I explained this cause and just one day they went from a nice family to assaulting my wife. We came home from the movies one night. Another neighbor of ours made it to the driveway before us so he was first. The people in number 10, whom I will now refer to as Psycho Biatch and Bumhole Husband had their family van parked out front of their house, across from my house. Kids were getting in and out of the van while Psycho was keeping an eye on things. Our other neighbor who lives on our side of the complex right next to us moved his car slowly past Psycho and the van first, we will call him Nice Neighbor for now. When Nice Neighbor slowly moved past the van there was no problem at all. My wife was right behind Nice Neighbor and did the exact same thing. Slowly moved her car past in full view of Psycho Biatch. The strange thing is that nothing happened. My wife made it past without even a glare. I got out and opened the garage door for her to park the car. We reversed the car into our garage and I was about to shut the rolling door when Psycho comes screaming over and yelling, accusing us of trying to run over her kids. She barged into our garage right past me and banged on the driver's side window to the point my wife had to roll the window down or Psycho would have broken it. She started pointing her finger and yelling about how dare my wife try and run over her kids. I want to point out that from the time my wife passed the van till the time Psycho came raging over was two minutes. Why didn't she blame nice neighbor and why didn't she say anything as my wife moved the car past the van? It's like the worst delayed reaction in history and to this day we still don't know the real reason they had it out for my wife and I. If the real reason was running over the kids, Psycho would have been in nice neighbor's face or in my wife's face while she moved the car past the van. My wife felt cornered and scared and I was about to drag Psycho out of our garage when Bumhole came storming over and threatened me to not touch his wife. So I had to leave my wife cornered and defenseless as to hold off Bumhole husband in the driveway. After a few minutes of screaming at my wife, Psycho went too far, she slapped my wife hard across the face and her sharp nails left multiple scratch marks and had her bleeding. That was the last straw for me as my adrenaline kicked in. I'm not a violent guy, I like to think I'm normally smart by having a policy of the best defense is to not get into a fight in the first place. I stormed over to Psycho but Bumhole grabbed my shoulder from behind and demanded to know where I was going. 
I turned round and gutted the idiot in the stomach with a right hook, then ignored him as he went down. I grabbed Psycho from behind as she was still wailing on my wife and threw her to the ground outside of our garage. I told them to get lost and leave us alone. We went inside and called the police to file a report. The police took notes and photos, I even said I punched bumhole in defense of my wife, I got nothing to hide. The police didn't do much apart from take notes and that was it. The Jekyll and Hyde 180 they pulled on us from good neighbors to assaulting my wife, really took us by surprise. In the weeks and months that followed we got insults, glaring and threats from units 10 and 11 as 11 joined their friends in condemning us. Most others in the complex took our side as they either saw or heard what happened. One thing was clear, units 10 and 11 had to go, we own our house and we aren't up and leaving our lives cause Psycho wants to start drama with us. First I called the managers of the complex, a corporation, and filed a report about both 10 and 11, showcasing all our documented proof of the harassment and threats towards us. Next I talked to their landlord who owned units 10 and 11 and about 5 other houses in the complex as he is a good friend. He seemed concerned but not enough to kick them out, guess he really wants rent payments. So I decided to get rid of them myself. First I found their Wi-Fi network and before I shut them out of it I got their email address, then locked them out of their own internet connection. I had their phone number from when we were good neighbors and got myself a burner phone. I signed them up for every spam email I could find, order takeout to be paid for on delivery every night of the week. I made sure their mailbox was stuffed with advertising, I even had men knocking on the door for promised fun only to leave angry and had them at each other's throats. I made sure their phone was ringing at all hours of the night, they even threw the phone out the window. As a final favor, I had a friend who runs a dog washing business come around pretending they booked her. When they explained they had no dogs and told her to frick off, she finally understood what we've been dealing with. They kept berating her to leave throwing in racial slurs, bad idea. She took out the hose meant to wash the dogs and sprayed psycho, bumhole and all over their carpet. I think they finally got the hint and moved out only a month later, number 11 followed them a few weeks after. The entire complex had a huge pool party and celebration. But I wasn't going to let them off that easy, that psycho wailed on my wife for no good reason, prepared to lose it all. From when we're on good terms with terms with psycho and bumhole, I knew they were on temporary visas while trying to apply for permanent residency. I made sure to mention to immigration where they had moved to. Thanks friends in the rental market, and handed over the police report of them assaulting us in our own home for no good reason. Seems Psycho didn't make her own police report so ours was the be all end all, and was enough to get them kicked out of the country. I know the country they come from, it's hard to get work, why a lot of people from that country move here. I feel zero remorse booting them out, zero, zip, nada. Long wind up revenge at the end. So basically, I moved into a two-bedroom apartment two months ago with Sarah and Jessica. Now, Sarah is on the lease, Jessica is Sarah's girlfriend and isn't on the lease. I pay 50%, Sarah pays 25% and Jessica pays 25% of rent. Not my ideal situation, but I was desperate for roommates at the time. Fast forward two months, they're enormous slobs who never do anything so I clean up after them all the time. I vacuum the living room, mop the kitchen, do dishes, etc. I buy most of the shared groceries and household items, which the two of them plow through really quickly. Sarah has a cat in the apartment which is unauthorized, and regularly has an unauthorized dog here too. Their rent is paid late in utilities on the last possible day. Also, the girls smoke copious amounts of weed and while I don't care, I ask them to be respectful enough to air out the apartment and keep the smoke out of my room. Now last week due to goes south, Sarah and Jessica overheard me bitching about having to clean up after them and after ignoring me for a few days, sent me a long text about how rude they considered that, etc. So I let out everything that was bothering me, and told them that if they don't want to live with me, I'll gladly release them from the lease, repay the deposit, and they can go. This causes them to freak out and they tell me, it's two against one, we will force you to move. Oh hell no. I block them on all forms of social media and means of communication. The next day, 
I went down to the apartment managers and reported the two unauthorized pets and the unauthorized occupant. Written notices were given, Sarah and Jessica threw them straight in the trash. I returned from a four-day stay at my dad's and go straight to report the unauthorized occupant Jessica, who has already once been asked to leave, and both unauthorized pets which were supposed to be gone by now. Well, at this point Sarah and Jessica are getting pissed off. Jessica screams obscenities at me any time I enter or leave my bedroom. Twice she spent a half hour period pounding on my door in the walls of my room. She taunts me through the door trying to get me to open up. All of this is being quietly recorded on my phone while I still haven't said a word. So yesterday, I went back down to the office to finish securing my new apartment and to report more violations. When I came home, the chain lock was locked so I had no way to get in. This is what I had been waiting for. Jessica taunts me again, on video I might add, and then slaps my hat off my head, hitting me square in the forehead with the back of her hand. Bingo! The revenge, I call the cops, rat Sarah and Jessica out for being druggies, get all their paraphernalia confiscated, and get a police report for battery. Come Monday, I'll be on my way to the prosecutor's office to press charges. The apartment managers will also be getting a copy of this report. Also, tomorrow is the last day to pay rent before it's late. Sarah and Jessica disappeared early this morning. If they don't pay rent I'm gonna get them on the abandonment clause, finally get them evicted, and have the locks change. All before I move out tomorrow. It's two against one? Think again. Thank you for enjoying this episode, which was made with artificial love. Subscribe or give Royal AI some sugar by avenging the like button. Could you imagine doing one of these acts yourself? Share your experience below. I'll join the conversation.